talking Illinois high school football. If your goals are as high as you talk about, tonight's the night you go out and just take one more step. It's a view from the West. And it starts right now! Welcome to View from the West podcast. Back with me once again, Mitch Stormer. Mitch, this week we're talking about week four, moving into week five. You know, like we said last week, we've blown well past that halfway point of this spring season. So as exciting as as it is, man, it's almost wrapping up. But we've seen a lot of good football. We got a lot of good football to talk about this week and a lot of good football still to come in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, it's like you said, this week, uh, week four is going to be really the end of the uh, the spring session for some teams. Uh, some teams still have t- uh, two or three games left. But yeah, we're starting to uh, kind of reel back from that excitement and starting to it comes to be real that, OK, we're almost done playing football, but still uh, plenty left. Yeah, I tell you what, though, the cool thing about this is every time you see somebody performing well, you see a player doing something and then you see he's only a junior or only a sophomore. Right. That's awesome because it's like the turnaround is going to be so much shorter than what we're used to. So this season yep. ends and then, you know, you move into summer and then you get those summer workouts, I think under somewhat different circumstances because of other sports that they're bumping into, but we're going to move into the fall pretty quick. And man, I just, I hope and pray that the fall looks and feels as close to normal as we can get. Cause that, right. I need that. I need that back. And right. I'm excited to get to that point. Well, and even on the even on the flip side of that, even for the seniors that are going through their final phase of the year, yeah, and they're putting up performances like they are, like that's what we wanted. That's you know, uh, this you know, this spring session as shortened as it is, um, or as condensed as it is, is really for them to get that final chance, whether they're just playing or whether they're trying to make it to the next level. And they are showing up every single week, so it's been uh, incredibly exciting. Absolutely. That's a great point that, yeah, this is really, this spring season was about giving those seniors that shot, you know, that one last chance, even as abbreviated as it is, I think, man, as for as much as we wanted football back, those kids needed it. Those kids wanted it back too, because this was their senior year. So yeah, you're Mm -hmm. absolutely right. Well, before we jump into things, I want to stop and thank everybody so much for joining in, for listening, downloading, subscribing. Mitch, did you see that we are officially now well over a thousand downloads for view from the west podcast how about that i saw that i saw that our our twitter followership was over like 250 so yeah thank you to everyone who has had some fun with us because that's certainly what it uh, what it feels like it's just a whole bunch of fun to talk about it with people who care about it yeah so it's good to know that we're not talking into an empty hallway or into yeah. our you know empty basement rooms that we're reporting right. in right Well, Mitch, we're going to start this week like we've started every week so far in this spring football season. We start with our viewpoints. We need to know, we need to hear about the players, the teams, the storylines that made the headlines and that caught your attention in week four. Mitch, where are you going with your first viewpoint? Yeah, I'm going to to start a bounce back game for uh, for Anna and Weathersfield. Um, They had a tough loss last week. They come back, uh, quarterback, one of the best quarterbacks in the state, Colton Quagliano, has a big game. We'll talk about it when we get into the game recap. Big game for him and for the team as well. They win big 52-6 to six over Stark County. You know, Mitch, I'm actually going to pivot off of your viewpoint of Anawan Weathersfield, and I'm going to go to the opposite side of that in Ridgewood. They had the huge win over a the week before. They go on the road to Marquette, and I know, I know, I'm a Marquette alum, but they're in my viewpoint this week. They're in my viewpoint this week because this was a great effort from them and a great performance over a Ridgewood team that I really believe has a great offense and has a great team. Marquette Crusaders started and ended with Jake Thomas. He had three interceptions in the game, including a pick six. He had a touchdown reception in the first quarter. He had a two-point conversion after they had scored the tie-breaking touchdown with a minute 21 left. Then he immediately turned around and got that pick six, which sealed the victory. And then to follow that up on Wet Ridgewood's next drive, he had another interception with, (laughs) you know, 14, 15 seconds left of the game to completely put it out of reach. Just, I mean, just that type of performance for him and for the Marquette Crusaders, I give them a lot of credit because they hung around with Anawan Weathersfield in week one, but A&W eventually pulled away. And in this one, I, I really, I didn't see this coming. I really, I really yeah. didn't. I give a lot of credit to Marquette. They're very well coached. 
Um, you know, Coach Yupst has been around a long time. Actually, we're both connected. Coach Yupst was a Morrison coach back in the 80s. Yeah. So yep. he's been around a long time. He knows how to get kids ready for the game, ready to play, mistake-free and focused. And, and they really did it. They, they delivered in a tough game against Ridgewood. So I give them a lot of credit. Mitch, where's your second viewpoint? I'm going to go to the game that we talked about last episode was probably our game of the week. Uh, and for good reason. It was Rock Island against Sterling. And I'm going to say just the whole Sterling unit, every every single unit that they had, offense, defense, special teams, they came to play a big win for the Warriors. They're defending their conference championship, maybe not be officially winning one this spring this spring session, but certainly looking like the team that would win it. Um, again, we'll, we'll get to some more specifics, but a big game. They had 430 yards rushing, and that's the way you stop an offense like Rocky. I'm going to stay in the Western Big Six. And I'm going with Geneseo forcing eight Quincy turnovers in that game. The, I mean, Geneseo's defense set the table all day for their offense to put points on the board. The defense put some points up on the board of their own. But you think, I mean, two weeks ago, maybe less than two weeks ago, Geneseo looked down and out. And, yeah. and now, now they're sitting at two and two. And this was a huge win. And this, this one really, I think, turns around the momentum of that program and hopefully for them can set them up for something as this year moves on. And then more importantly, into the fall, when things are kind of back to, you know, back going for real, this is a big win for Geneseo 42, seven over Quincy, Mitch, what's your third viewpoint? My third one is going to break my heart a little bit. And you probably know where I'm going with this. Um, I'm headed to the track. I'm headed to the wooden shoe bowl. What a, a absolutely astounding performance from Fulton they're they're three and oh now I think they've yeah they've definitely scored over 40 points in every three games and I think they've only allowed maybe 14 points they yeah. went 56 to nothing over Morrison um and Morrison's numbers are down but when we talk about this game and the game recaps just how they did it I don't know if a full strength Morrison team would have beat them Fulton looks good again they went 56 nothing they retained that wooden shoe trophy for the foreseeable future yeah, with, you know, Fulton moving to the NUIC, like you said, for the foreseeable future, that wooden shoe is headed down the road to Fulton. Mitch, does that break your heart? We think of that imagery of that wooden shoe loaded up in the bus in Fulton. It's, it's headed out of town, man. Well, yeah, you, you had sent me a picture of, or I think you tweeted out on our account of yep. what the trophy looks like. And I, I zoomed in on it. I, I looked at the years that I was there and I, I copied it or I, I uh, cropped it out and sent it to you. I love uh, it. So those are memories uh not well let me say that they're far and away from a 56 to nothing loss um but (laughs) yeah again kudos to Fulton because they absolutely earned this one yeah we'll get into the details on that one because that was that was a big win and I again thought it would be much closer than that but you know Fulton really looks tough my final viewpoint Mitch have you heard of uh Hunter Hoffman from Dupec have you heard of him he yeah, he sounds familiar to, uh, yeah. to the show and uh, to our coverage, yeah. Yeah, I tweeted out, note to self, talk about Dupec on the podcast because, you know, they're doing things. Man, they are they look really good. Hunter yeah. Hoffman, seven touchdowns in the first half. I would, I would call that video game numbers, but I would struggle to do that in a video game yeah. if I tried right now. Nope. So right. seven yep. passing touchdowns is, that is something. That is... He looks really good. Dupec looks really good. And they got a lot of pieces that are coming back next year for the fall. That's exciting football for them. The Rivermen are a team to watch this year and a team to watch yep. next year too. Big, big fans of the podcast too, I think. I know. I love it. I love it. I appreciate all their support. If they're listening right now, I love it. Thank you so much for listening. All right. Before we get to the NUIC, we'll get there, but let's jump into the Western Big Six like we talked about, so many big games. And the great thing is, Mitch, every game, every result in the Western Big Six six this week had a storyline involved with it. And Mm -hmm. we'll get into all of them, but you got to start with Sterling Rock Island. That's the game we circled. That's the game everybody had on their mind. And it lived up to the billing, but maybe not early. Sterling's defense held Rock Island scoreless for the first three quarters. Defensive coordinator Mike LeMay had his unit prepared. They executed against a very high-powered offense that we've talked about this season. 
But on the flip side, Rock Island's offense got it going in the fourth quarter and they got it going quickly. They were down 27 to six late fourth quarter. They get a 60 yard Perry Slater kickoff return. That sets up Cole Rusk for a 20 yard touchdown catch from Eli Reese. The conversion failed. Rock Island was still down 27 12 with a minute 10 left. They get the onside kick. It's Cole Rusk recovering the onside kick. Perry Slater with a great catch. He runs in from 20 yards for a touchdown. Then it's Reese hitting Rusk on a two point conversion, but Rusk was just out of bounds. That still made it 27 to 18. And there was still some time left on the clock. Sterling was able to cover the last onside kick and come away with the win, but just a great effort from both sides, you know, a frantic comeback attempt from a great offense, but the defensive performance from Sterling proved to be just so much. A game that we circled as, as a game of the week, um, the defending conference champions of Sterling against not upbeat. I don't want to say that, but certainly the first three games of the year, they looked pretty unbeatable uh, in rock Island. And yeah, it was the defense because Rocky had chances. If, if I was, if I thought was following along correctly, I think Rocky was inside the five yard line of Sterling twice in the first half and they turned it over that. both times. Yep. I think there was a, I think one was a fumble and one was an interception. So, um, but when Sterling had the ball, I think I mentioned in my viewpoint, they had 430 rushing yards. Like you want to stop a defense, you control the clock. They controlled 63 minutes out of 96 in this game. Well, that's the thing. If, if, if Rock Island doesn't have the ball in their hands on offense, like it's much harder for them to score. So credit yeah. to Sterling for that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and part of that 430 yards rushing was, was Noel Ponte. I mean, he's yeah. been, he's been their guy every week. He had a career best, uh, 177 yards, three touchdowns. Also on one of the first plays of the game picks off Rocky quarterback, Eli Reese for the first time all season. So Mr. Do it, everything, Mr. Ponte, a great job for him. That's what I was going to say. That's, that's the thing. When you got a guy like that, like, man, we've talked about it in weeks past, big time playmakers show up in those games in those big time games. And it it's right here. This is the definition of it right here with Noah Ibante. Yeah. I mean, you get the interception, I believe going up against Cole Rusk, maybe not on that play. I think it was. was. Okay. He was going up against Rusk on a lot of plays. He, well, and on that particular play, Rusk was open. Rusk was yeah. wide open. And in a Ponte, he, he, I don't know if the ball was underthrown or if Ponte made up the ground, but yeah, he, Rusk was wide open on that play. Yeah, it's it's a huge effort because we've talked about Cole Rusk and how dangerous he is. And he was at the end of this game. He caught yeah. a touchdown pass that put him within 27-12. And then he recovered the onside kick immediately. I mean, mm-hmm. Rusk is a ball player. We've seen it all year long. And so Noe Ponte has the huge responsibility of covering him and then turn around on offense and get the right. job done. And he did it and he did it. He did it well. So credit to Sterling. They, I mean, they continue to impress in the Western big six and this was maybe their biggest test they've had yet for as good as rock Island yeah. has looked early in this year. This was probably the biggest test they've had. Well, and like we said, Sterling is the defending champs in the conference and rock Island's trying to get over it. Sterling just appears to be, the team that they need to get over in the last two games that these two have played Sterling has over a thousand yards of total offense against them. So just two straight years of unbelievable effort from the Warriors. They do it again uh, this past weekend and get a huge win. Yep. Well, Mitch, we'll move it. We'll move along another game, another storyline in the Western big six. Hey, United township has a new streak in the Western big six. Yes, yes, sir. It's a winning streak. United township gets the 33 14 win over all of them. And you got to love to see it. You know, these kids, they talked about it. And uh, Coach Welch talked about it. As soon as that Moline game was over, they were flipping the script. They were shutting it off. They were moving on to the next game. And they did it. You know, and they did the job well. They were up 27-0 at one point and really left no doubt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we talked about it back. um, It was the Rocky game that we talked about how their effort that they were putting in was going to translate to wins. Yep. And now not only is it translating to wins, it's translating into big wins. It's translating into dominant wins. Um, and that's led by Kane Smith uh, every single week. Um, Absolutely. And another huge week for him, both on the ground. And he had a, re- a receiving touchdown this week too. Yeah. He had 232 yards on 16 carries, three more touchdowns. 
he's really making a name for himself. And, you know, that's, that's a kid you got to love if you're Nick Welch. Cause man, again, he's a playmaker, he's a gamer and they got a quarterback doing the same thing for him. Um, you know, Gady, and it, it's been a great effort from them. So credit to United Township, because let's be honest over the past, you know, several years, there's very few and far between wins that come as comfortable wins for United Township. Yeah. And right. this was, this was that, I mean, they, they mm-hmm. were up 27, nothing that, you know, they win 33, 14, like we talked about credit to them that that's a big win and a big step in the right direction for that program moving yep. along to another big win. And again, just another storyline Geneseo is Owen two. I think like it was less than 14 days ago. It was less than mm-hmm. maybe 10 days ago because they played games real close together. They yeah. get the win. 42 to seven over Quincy on Saturday. And man, it was wet and it was cold. Geneseo's defense comes up with eight Quincy turnovers that set the table all day for their offense. They scored a couple of uh, touchdowns on defense as well. Like I referenced in my viewpoint, but just a huge effort. Second play of the game, uh, Caden Davison, 25 yard scoop and score. The Maple Leafs are up seven to nothing less than a minute in. Then later, Connor Helke gets a fumble recovery. Leafs take over at the Quincy 22. Then it's Bruce Moore, a name that we've talked about. He brings it, I believe, all 22 yards from there, running the ball, punches it, punches it in to be up 14-0. Oh, a little while later, P.J. Mosier, an interception. That sets them up on the Quincy six-yard line. Mason Jones from two yards out. On a fourth down play, they converted. They're up 21 nothing, and that was it. I mean, they were running away with it, with it from yep. there. You know, outside of maybe being on field turfs, he didn't have the mud and the, you know, the dirty jerseys. Man, this yep. was a this was a grinded out Geneseo defensive victory. Right. Um, and, and again, not to sound like a broken record when we talk about Geneseo, but maybe their transition into that new offense has clicked faster than maybe we certainly thought. Um, because back to back weeks, our offense has been clicking and it's, it's led by Bruce Moore. I, I don't know how many yards he had this week, but he continues to be, like you said, a name that we talk about just about every week because he's setting the tone for them. But again, just that entire offense putting up the points and then the defense, you know, making sure that they aren't on the field very long, get the offense back on the field. It's, it's working in Geneseo. It's, it's good to see. Yep, absolutely. All right. Moving right along. Again, the fourth storyline. Like I said, every game this week in the Western Big Six had a story connected to it. Moline goes on the road to Galesburg. They get their first win of the year, 27-24 over Galesburg. It's a Silver Streaks team that we've talked up a lot. We've talked a lot about them. And we've talked about on the opposite side, Moline is close. They were getting there. They were inching there. This week, they finally put things together. Alec Ponder, he, like I said, he hasn't, they haven't been getting the victories, but he's been doing some really good things for this yeah. Moline offense. He did it again this week. He had 357 yards, four touchdowns. Now, that being said, this was not a f- perfect game on either side. He had to overcome three interceptions, but on the flip side, Moline recovered three fumbles from Galesburg. So yeah. it was far from perfect, but man, Moline was desperate for a win and, and they got one. They got the, the road win. Yeah, and I I think we talked about this with maybe Rocky last week. You know, that's a measure of a team is is how well you can play if you're not playing your best. Um, And and maybe Moline, you know, I know that they played Rocky pretty close to start off the year. Um, And maybe in this game, maybe again, maybe not their best game, but signs of life are there. And when you have enough of that, you're going to win games. So kudos to them on the first one of the year. Um, and, And again, like you said, very close against Galesburg. Yeah, it, I mean, it's a lot of teams in this Western Big Six. We talked about Moline was in week one against Rock Island. We felt like right. they were close. And United yeah. Township, we felt like they were building and they were close. And now you're seeing it play out that Moline gets their first win. Geneseo's two and two. United mm-hmm. Township's two and two. So there you go. Like, it's it's a lot of teams that are right there. Yep. And if things work out the way, you know, the way they want them to, they can get some wins. We should mention, Mitch, before we move on real quick, an unfortunate – not great situation in Moline. Um, it went uh, viral and then made, you know, made news this week. Um, you know, a situation involving Moline players and harassment and bullying. Um, the Moline police have been involved 
and they were interviewing players. It sounds like right after the game or shortly after the team arrived back in Moline after the game. So the player involved has since released a statement. The Moline police have also released a statement I'm hoping that it's a learning situation for a lot of people involved. It, it's a terrible situation. Um, you, you just hope that it's resolved and that there's some sort of learning and justice involved. Um, so I don't know what else to say about it. I don't think I really want to comment much more on it. It's out there if you know someone hasn't heard about it. But anyway, it's just an ugly situation. We hope that everybody can move along from it. Um, we'll move along to the Three Rivers Athletic Conference. And Mitch, I hate to do it to you, but I got to ask you about that wooden shoe bowl, man. Yeah. Fulton wins 56 to nothing over Morrison. Yeah. Mitch, oh, does it hurt? <laughs> You're a Mustang alum. Does it hurt? Let, let, me, let, me, let me say this, not as an excuse, but as, as something that a lot of teams go through. I don't even think we knew – it was to this extent yeah. that according to coach Otting, I think Morrison's only got 18 or 19 players. And that's, that's again, yeah. it's, it's not an excuse. That's a hard thing to do. That's, that's hard. You know, yep. you've only got 11 on the field at one time. So you've definitely got multiple players playing two ways. Um, and then when you go up against, and it, by the way, makes their performance, you know, their seven point loss against Newman, maybe even that much more impressive. But yeah. when you play a team like Fulton, that's going to, you know, run and gun all over you. It's going to tire out really quick. Um, so again, I'm not, I don't want to <laughs> take it away from Fulton because <laughs> they just completely dominated this game. Um, they start off, Kyler Pestman takes the opening kickoff back for a touchdown. Yep. On the ensuing kickoff, the Mustangs fumble it. Fulton recovers. And the very next play, Fulton scores. So they're up 14 nothing, not 30 seconds into the game. And that's how it went the entire half. I think they were, I think Fulton was up 42 or 49 to nothing at half. Um, that Connor Barnett was like eight of nine um, passing. So just things that Fulton has been doing to every team that they've played this year so far, they're three and oh. Um, they've put up 40, at least 40 every single game. I think they've only given up six in one game, maybe seven in another, obviously a shout out here against Morrison. So um, more than anything, it's, it's an outstanding performance from Fulton. And like you said, they, they keep that trophy uh, there at Fulton high school for, for a little while longer. Man, I got to be honest, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to miss this game. I'm going to miss this rivalry game. It was, it was fun. And there's, there's only really two trophy games on the Western side of the state in, in the conferences that we're talking about here. And that's Princeton Kiwani, which we saw last week, and the wooden shoe. That's yeah. that's that's all we got. So, you know, I don't. I, I read a couple of different people say that you know, hold on, it's not gone forever, and that's true. They'll both be in one yeah. A. Inevitably, they may make a playoff appearance against each other, but there's no sure thing. There's nothing on the calendar you can look to and say, here we go. You know, year in and year out, it's going to happen. Yeah, I'm going to miss that. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna start now the the campaign for Morrison moving to the NUIC. Let's <laughs> yeah, let's it, figure out a way to make it happen. I've already talked to Kyle Kampmeyer about it. Let's figure out a yeah. way to make it happen. Yeah, maybe that conversations that conversations already happened. So you never that's the thing in in this day and age, especially with small school football, you just you never know. So uh, you never say never. Uh, we, we hopefully uh, that trophy will be coming out of the uh, the cabinet uh, sooner yeah. than later. Well, people hate me for saying this, but Maybe someday if Illinois goes to district football, then they'll assuredly be in the same no. district and we'll, we'll see it. So no, no. <laughs> see, you hate me for saying it. No. Yeah. just no. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we'll, we'll move along here. If we're going to be talking undefeated teams in the three rivers athletic conference, we got to jump next to the Princeton Tigers. They get a win last week over Orion 48 to seven. They put up 466 yards of total offense. Quarterback Tyler Gibson threw for 236 yards, three touchdowns through the air. He added another one on the ground. Rondé Worrells continues to do work on the ground. He gets a pair of touchdowns for himself. Another very impressive win from Princeton. You know, we talked about last week that Orion was showing signs of improvement, but I think that they really just ran into a buzzsaw this week in Princeton. Princeton Tigers are really, they're one of the best teams in the state, certainly one of the best teams in our area. 
And, you know, they're really a program that is on the map around the state. I think that, you know, heading into next fall, people really know about the Princeton Tigers and that that's a lot of excitement. If we keep moving down the three rivers, Mitch, this is setting up to be an undefeated showdown next week for Princeton. There's another team that's undefeated in the three rivers. Newman, 35 to six win over St. Bede. Yeah. There's a matchup of two undefeated teams and Newman made it look pretty easy. Mitch, what do you got on this one? Yeah. They also made it look pretty good uh, <laughs> because they, they wore their all blues, Greg. Okay. That yeah. Looked, that looked nice. I know we got a little bit of heat from coach out there saying that we dogged it, which we didn't, we did not <laughs> dog it. Uh, we just might prefer their traditional look more, but they yeah. had it on the, on the weekend. Looked great. But so coach Kresper said, players call for that that's what players yeah. want they want the all blues so i yeah. think it's you know coaches giving in saying all right we'll do it this week so yeah um but i, th- I think that game was on saturday in yep. sterling and like you talked about in a couple of games in the western big six nasty weather that day um yep. and when it's a nasty weather rainy wet that is going to favor Newman every single time go um, figure go figure that sterling and newman both wit or uh, sorry that Geneseo and Newman both win on days that are rainy, nasty weather. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and, this, and like I said, you know, this is a traditional Newman game. But how about the defense? Like you said, Bruce St. Bede was undefeated coming into this game. They allow 32 yards and all of 15 of which didn't come until the end of the game. So uh, unbelievable defense from Newman. Um, Andrew Velasquez, we've, we've named him a couple times in, in yep. the recaps. He has 106 yards, two touchdowns. So a, a ground and pound game that Newman is used to, and it's hard to overcome. And we're going to talk about this at the end of the conference. Sets up a big game next week, I should say this week, with, uh, with Princeton. Yeah, that's a huge game. We'll get to that when we preview what's coming up next. We'll keep rolling along here. Erie Provincetown gets the 44 to nothing win over Bureau Valley. Erie Provincetown junior quarterback Colby Franks and running back Connor Sibley. They did the job for the Panthers. Franks with two passing, two rushing touchdowns. He did most of the damage with his legs, but he was four for five passing and two of those passes being touchdowns. So if you're going to only pass on a limited basis, yeah. put him in the well end zone. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, you might as well score. Yeah, that'll uh, work so out yeah, pretty well. Uh, Sibley yeah. added 130 yards and a touchdown. So big effort from Erie Provincetown Panthers. And Mitch, another big win. Kiwani 42 to 14 over Spring Valley Hall. What'd mm-hmm. you see in this one? Yeah, uh, I saw some speed. Uh, yeah. you had you had a play of the week nomination here. You had Boilmaker Melkin de Jesus. Uh, he had an 86 yard kickoff return. He's a big track star. He showed why on this one. He just, yep. just blows past all the devils that were on, on his way. Uh, and credit here to to our friend, friend of the show, Brian Stocky, who came up with this nugget that I don't know how he came up with. <laughs> He's the only one that could come up with this. The only one that would ever had known this. It's the first time that Kiwani has consecutive wins against Hall in nearly 30 years. I think the last time it happened was like 92, 93. So, again, why Brian Stocky knows that, I don't know. But credit to Kiwani because that, that series seems to be back and forth for the last 30 years. Yeah, yeah. Um... I'm not exaggerating. How he knows that is because he has it written down, (laughs) handwritten in a notebook that he keeps in a binder, in a briefcase that he carries with him. I'm not making that up. If anyone knows Brian Stocking, they know it's true. That's, that's what he does. He is. Yeah. He's, he's crazy. He's, he's (laughs) awesome. I shouldn't say crazy. He's amazing what he knows. If you haven't listened, anyone listening, go back and listen to the episode where we interviewed Dan Pearson Dan Pearson from KWQC's Highlight Zone. He worked with Brian Stocking for 15 years, approximately, maybe more than that. And he gives some good stories about Brian Stocking, and we go back and forth about it. I I think we got to get him on the show. Maybe in the offseason, but maybe as a fall preview. We got to get him on. Absolutely. He's he's more of an evergreen interview. You have to get him (laughs) when he can really wax poetic about you know, the history of the IHSA. He needs to. Yeah. You'd have to have the edit button ready for it, but I think, <laughs> I think we should look into it. Abs- absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Mitch, moving right along, 
Sherrard gets the big win over Monmouth Roseville, 34-28. That's their second win of the year, coming up with a win over the Titans. What would you see in that one? Yeah, a back-and-forth game. Um, it looked like both defenses had uh, you know key momentum stops throughout the game, especially in that first half. Uh, maybe the highlight play was Sherrard QB, QB Eli Brenier had a 46-yard QB keeper that looked real nice. Um, but speaking of looking nice, Greg, let me – let me say yes. one thing here. Yes. Okay. I want to apologize to Sherrard and, and all the <laughs> Sherrard fans and players. Cause I don't think I, I took that uniform. Uh, I, I think I took it for granted a little bit when we did our uni rankings. Yep. Because I really like them. Um, and if anyone who hasn't seen them, they look just like LSU. It's an LSU kind of template down to the socks. Like they've got the two tone, like cap is purple. Ankle is white. Um, and they do a great job of keeping them clean. Let me say that because they looked really <laughs> good on film against a team that you like in Monmouth. So a, uh, a great, a great uniform matchup over the weekend. So my, my apologies to Sherrard, they might even snuck up into my top four had I really been thinking about it. So, um, yeah, they looked good. Congrats to them on their second win. Well, you said you made an interesting point when we did the uni view to begin, you said that they had LSU's colors and look, but the Alabama kind of helmet with numbers on it, correct? Yeah, yeah, I, and and maybe I saw it wrong. Maybe they're doing either what a lot of teams are doing. They've got number on one side and a logo on the other. I'm not sure if I saw it right, but yeah, okay. um, at least in, in certain variations, I saw just a number on their helmet, but in, in just the jersey alone, it, it looked really nice. All right, well, I'm, for anyone who's listening who doesn't know what we're talking about, Go out to YouTube, search View From The West podcast, and you can find our UniView power rankings. We go through every conference. We go through the Western Big Six, the Three Rivers Athletic Conference, the Lincoln Trail, and the Northwest Upstate Illini. We got all the videos up there. We're talking uniforms. You've got the visual aid of YouTube to show you the uniforms as we're talking about them. Go check them out. At the end of this spring season, we're going to put together our ultimate power rankings and put them into a top 10 and me and Mitch got to agree on our top 10 and I I'm not sure we're quite there so that's going to be yeah. interesting so we'll, and we keep de- we keep delaying this conversation probably for good reason so we'll get there eventually <laughs> we'll get there we'll get there and Mitch here we go the big reason that we're delaying this podcast a little bit is because we had some Monday night football three rivers had a little Monday night football this week in Rock Ridge And man, Rockridge just keeps on rolling. They get the win 60 to 25 over Riverdale. Rockets move to 4 0. And Mitch, man, they just, they keep impressing me. Yeah. And I'll be honest, we didn't talk about them enough. We didn't, yeah. We didn't, I didn't know what to expect out of Rockridge. And now I certainly, they've opened my eyes. Yeah. Braden Deem and and Peyton Locker are making us not eat our words because we didn't really have words, but they're, uh, (laughs) uh, they're really, they're really going to put a spotlight on it because, like you said earlier, the teams that have players coming back, Rockridge is one of them because I think both these guys are coming back. Um, this game just wrapped up right when we started, um, so I don't have the full numbers on it. But by my count, I think Peyton Locke had six touchdowns tonight. So, Jeez, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, they're they're rolling. Look, looking ahead, they might finish the spring six and zero. Um, so big things happening in Rockridge. Another big win. Yeah, Mitch, we already move along to the Lincoln Trail Conference. Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's talk. I think we got to start with Princeville. Princeville gets the big yeah. win, 41-8 to eight over United. They don't get probably talked about enough on this podcast because they're not quite the western side of the state. They're almost kind of creeping towards central Illinois. Yeah. But for purposes of the Lincoln Trail, we're going to talk about them on here. Princeville looked really good this week. Yeah, um, like you said, they're up to 4-0 now. They're up to number 6 in one a um and, and yeah like like you said they they might not get a whole lot of, of coverage in the qc since they're um more peoria you know that area but uh, let me tell you something credit to the coach name is john carruthers yep i was just reading a story tonight in the pj star which is the peoria journal star yep. um the journalist his name is sam morris there was he was talking about how over the summer there were a member of the prince's football team that would meet at a local park and this is in the summer when they didn't know what was going to happen in the fall. They didn't know if the, if the season was going to happen or not. And on their own, unbeknownst to Coach Carruthers, were getting ready for a season that they didn't know 
if it was going to happen or not. That's awesome. And that's where we've talked about before that, you know, that we, that's what we love about high school football, that kids are just playing to have fun for the most part. But the other side of that is they've got good players. They've got an all state lineman, uh, Peyton Garcia. He's going to St. Ambrose to play next year. They've got a quarterback, uh, in, in Princeton is a traditional running offense and they've got a quarterback, uh, in Sam Stite matter who, or street matter, I should say, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He adds a little bit of a throwing dynamic to that offense. Hunter Boland is a running back and they're all conference linebackers. So, um, yeah, they kind of went under our radar a little bit and that's a fault of ours, but, uh, no longer because, uh, the princes are, are for real. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I expected them to be good this year. They've been good the last few years. But like I said, I think that they always kind of on the Western side of the state get a little short change because they're much more, they're the most centrally located, you know, central Illinois team in the Lincoln trail. So they're not yeah. really covered by the quad cities viewing area. So, you know, they kind of fall out of our, out of our view, but um, right. no, they're certainly putting up big numbers and they look really good. Another team putting up big numbers, bouncing back this week. Like we referenced in your viewpoints, Mitch Anawan Weatherfield, they're back mm-hmm. at it. They looked great. 52 to six over Stark County. Colton Quagliano, he's yep. he's maybe the best in the state. He looked really yeah. good again this week. Yeah, 14 and 19 for 259. He had five touchdowns. Uh, and, and I think he added another one. Yeah. So um, he had four touchdowns alone in the first quarter. Titans moved yep. to three and one. Uh, but he's not, you know, he's he might be the name uh, that gets all the rep, but certainly not the only weapon that they have. Darius Dickerson, he rushes for 94 yards and a touchdown on eight carries. He also had a 50-yard touchdown reception. Um, and they've got they've got a bunch of guys. Uh, Tucker Miller or Tucker Miller, I should say, with four yep. receptions. Um, and three three of them were touchdowns. Brady Kelly had three catches and a touchdown. So yeah, a, a good bounce back win for the Titans here um, and that whole unit. Yep. Well, moving right along, uh, the Titans were bouncing back from a loss to Ridgewood. Ridgewood traveled on the road to Marquette. We talked about it. It was one of my viewpoints. Marquette comes away with a 30 to 14 win. This was a close game throughout Marquette pulled away late, but I give credit to Marquette's defense because they have to hold down a Ridgewood offense that has been dynamic this year. They've been able to run the ball effectively. They have a stall at quarterback who's been effectively passing to Kessinger and Althaus. And they've been putting up big numbers. They put up big numbers against Anwan Weathersfield. It's really opened our eyes. And this week, Marquette was able to slow them down. Marquette was able to really limit what they were going to do or what they wanted to do. And again, what we talked about, Jake Thomas, three interceptions. He had the game ceiling pick six late in the fourth quarter. Just a huge effort from Marquette. And, you know, that's another team. Marquette's a team that they're not really, quote unquote, on the western side of the state. They're inching more mm-hmm. towards central Illinois. But in this case, they are playing the Lincoln Trail teams this season, this spring season. I got to give them credit. You know, they're sitting at two and two now. Um, they come away with this win against what I think is a very good Ridgewood team. And here's the thing. Ridgewood's just fine. They, you know, they're, they're going to yeah. bounce back. They're going to be great. And this was just a good defensive effort from Marquette. Mm -hmm. It was a good football game. It was a lot of fun to watch. Um, I was able to watch the live stream for most of it. So it was was a good one there. Um, Moving along, Mercer County gets another big win. They win 28 to eight over mid County. So the golden Eagles, you know, racking up another win, you know, I think just the Lincoln trail is going to be interesting moving into next year um, because we're tossing in Knoxville and having to Navon with some of these teams, like we've talked about that, They've had success. They're having, you know, even United who fell this week, but we talked about them in weeks past putting up a lot of points. I think there's a lot to look forward to in the Lincoln trail. Yep. Mitch moving down the road to the NUIC Northwest upstate Illini. We're talking about the Northwest upstate Illini. I got to start with my viewpoint. I got to start with Dupec. Yep. They're get the win 47 to 20 over Orangeville. Hunter Hoffman. That, that's where I'm going here. Hunter Hoffman, <laughs> yep. in the rain, like we've talked about, the weather was less than ideal across the state of Illinois on Saturday. In the rain, seven passing touchdowns in the first half against an Orangeville team that's very good. It's no pushover in Orangeville. So just a huge effort from Dupec. They get the 47-20 win. They looked really good. Mitch, you got any number else? other numbers from that one? 
Yeah, Hoffman goes 21 to 38 for 357 and like you said, seven TDs. <laughs> um, and, and he throws to a bunch of different guys. By my count, there was six different players who caught those seven touchdown passes. So, wow, yeah. Um, yeah, just a, a great uh, a great game for them. Uh, on Orangeville's side, they had a, a nice running back performance or a running performance from running back Kay Janecki. He rushed for 22, rushed 22 times for 131 yards, had three scores, just wasn't enough against the Dupac team that's playing really well at three and one. Yeah, we'll talk more about Orangeville in a minute because they have an interesting matchup coming up next yeah. week. But moving along, um, the next team that, you know, you got to bring up when we're talking Northwest Upstate Illini this spring, Aquin, Freeport Aquin, 40 to 12 win over East Dubuque. Another effort from Will Gustafson. And, uh, you know, they, they put up the, the points again, 40 points again in a, in a big win. Yeah, I think, I think it took them maybe a little bit longer to get rolling than they, uh, than they have been. But, yeah, yeah. like you said, um, when we're talking about Hunter Hoffman, the, the counter, this counterpoint in the conference is, is Will Gustafson. He goes for, by my count, just under 300 total yards, um, four touchdowns. Ty Cycle has another big game with 150 yards. That's the name um, I, was, and, I was trying to think yeah. of, yeah. Yeah, and Andrew Bowman is usually Gustafson's top receiver. He goes for 88 yards and a touchdown. So more of the same from Aquin. Just uh, I think probably depending on which ranking you looked at, I think they're number one now in 1A. I, I, we might talk to Kyle because he sees a couple different ones. But yep. they're certainly playing up to that that level. Yep, absolutely. A um, couple other teams playing up to that level, playing really well. Galena gets the 14-6 to win over Stockton. That's, I mean, you talk about the longtime rivalries in the NUIC. That's, that's certainly up there. That may be one of the best ones. Galena gets the big win. They're putting together a great spring season. Another team putting together a great spring season is Milledgeville. Milledgeville gets the win 22 to 12 over Eastland Pearl City. For Milledgeville, they're now sitting at three and one. And this is their farewell to 11 man football. So yeah. credit to the missiles there. You know, this is a, you know, a fond farewell. It looks really good for them to build some positive momentum heading into what I think will be very beneficial for them to go to the eight man game. So they get mm-hmm. the nice win there. Moving along, Amboy gets the 16 to eight win over West Carroll. Forrest in a big win, 48 to 23 over Rockford Christian. Let's go through a few eight man scores we have here. Polo. 24-22 over Hiawatha, River Ridge 40 to nothing over Flanagan, and South Beloit 58 to 18 over Ashland Franklin Center. So Mitch, we've rolled through the results, we've rolled through the games from the previous week. Let's jump ahead. Let's see what we got next week. There's a couple interesting matchups that have come about unfortunately, I think because of COVID situation. Yeah. But some interesting matchups. Yeah, uh, you, you name the conference, Greg, and I'll tell you what we're going to be looking at here in the next uh, the next week. Well, I think, you know, since I kind of teased it right there, let's, let's say those are in the Northwest Upstate Illini, but let's go to the Western Big Six. Let, let's start with the big schools. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, you're going to see uh, you're going to see if, if United can keep it rolling. They're going to go against Galesburg. Galesburg, I think, started 2-0, and then they lost the last two games. So, yep. uh, United, they, they are at the Soul Bowl, so – uh, look for them to continue their winning ways there. A team that we, again, have started to talk about more and more every week as being impressive, Geneseo. They're going to go to Rocky. That, that's a very intriguing matchup. See if Rocky yep. can get back on track and see if Geneseo's offense is for real um, against a Rocky defense that has maybe shown susceptible to uh, having some points scored on them. So that game's at Rocky. Quincy and Alleman, two schools trying to get back on the, on the winning page. They play on Saturday at Alleman. Uh, and then Sterling going to keep looking to uh, continue off their big win against Rock Island. They're going to go to Moline. Uh, that's at Browning Field. What I really love is Galesburg and United Township. Yeah. There's team Galesburg being 2-0 and two weeks ago, and United Township was on the flip side being 0-2. And yep. now here we sit, both teams being 2-2. Two and two, And that is a very intriguing matchup to me. That one. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking maybe a little closer at Geneseo and Rock Island just True. to see, yep. uh, again, if, if Rock Island can come back from a from a loss like the one that they had, you know, a, a close, you know, maybe not so close, tough loss, we'll say, yep. to Sterling. And Geneseo, see if they can keep uh, add another win. Well, what I love about that matchup is 
you look at Rock Island's offense versus the Geneseo defense, and mm-hmm. Geneseo's coming off an eight turnover performance, you know, forcing eight turnovers on defense. And this is the ultimate test. If you've got a good defense, like Sterling, you know, Sterling proved it against Rock Island. If you've got a good defense, go up against Rock Island, see what you can do. Right. It's a tall task for Geneseo, but it's one I want. It's, I want to see it. That's what I want to yeah. see. That's what I'm looking right. forward to. But I go back to, you know, Galesburg and United Township. Galesburg's got to limit the turnovers. You know, they, they turned the ball over, fumbled three times against Moline. And essentially, I think that cost them the game. Similar to if you fumble three times against United Township, UT is just as powerful, if not a little bit more powerful of an offense than Moline. At least they're very right. comparable. So you can't make those type of mistakes. So I think that, you know, Galesburg certainly knows what they have to do. They, you know, limit turnovers and they got to put up points like they've done. That's two potentially dangerous offenses going up against each other. That's, that's a very fascinating matchup. Yep. Mitch, let's move along to the three rivers. What are we seeing? Sure. Um, and I, sh- I should have prefaced this with the Western big six. We, we might be going off of outdated information. It's, it's, it's hard to keep up with, with the changes from time to time. So yep. uh, obviously if you're, if you're a listener looking to go to a game, maybe double check. Uh, obviously players listen to your coaches over us because they might know where you're playing more than we might. Um, well, I was going to say this big, year is so different because I mean, there are yeah. games being canceled the week of, and then new opponents and, I've seen three or four different teams from our area who have had to cancel or who are yeah. looking for opponents. So we're trying to keep up. So we'll, we'll, well say and, that much. And, we're trying to keep up. And well, and even in that situation, that's the cool thing about where social media has come, especially Twitter, yep. because all you got to do, Kiwani was just going through it. Kiwani needed to pick up a game this week. And I think they picked up, uh, you know, Farmington within a day. I so just, it's, I it's just cool looked that see. one up because I wanted to make sure we didn't forget it. Yes. So we'll start yeah. there. Kiwani is going up against Farmington. That's a great matchup. That's a great yeah. pickup for the Boilermakers. It's a test. It's a tough challenge. Farmington's a good football team, but that's right. a perfect scenario, perfect crossover game that we'd never see under normal circumstances. So. Right. And in games that, you know, we talked about early in the season that you wouldn't see um, because what's what's the harm in doing it this yep. year you know in the spring so you get the you make sure that the kids get all their games um and, and you pick up a fun opponent that you might not ever see so yeah uh kudos to them uh elsewhere in the conference in the mississippi the big game that we talked about um the i would say the de facto conference championship but i don't think that's true anymore princeton against newman uh that's going to be at sterling high school uh big one there Crew St. B going to try and come off of the their three and one, trying to rebound against the struggling Burrow Valley team. It's at Burrow Valley on Saturday, so we'll see if uh, the Bruins can get back into the win column there. In the Rock, Morrison's going to try and pull out of that that hole that they're in against an EPT, your Provincetown team that just won. That's at Provincetown High School. Uh, classic matchup: Orion and Sherrard. Yeah. Uh, Orion struggle. Orion struggling. Sherrard surging a little bit. Uh, that's at Sherrard High School. Um, I think one that wasn't listed, I believe Fulton is playing Monmouth Roseville. So um, add that to the, uh, the Kiwani game there in, in the uh, three rivers. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. We'll let me, go let to... me bring this up while we're, let me bring this up while we're talking about that, Greg. Yes. Cause I, I mentioned that uh, the Princeton Newman game might be like the de facto conference championship as a whole, even though they're broken up into two divisions in the rock in the, in the three rivers rock, you've got Fulton Newman, and Rock Ridge all sitting at undefeated. So yeah, I don't, I think, I don't know if, if either of them play each other throughout the year. I think Newman's on their last game. They're playing Princeton. I think that's the last game of the year. It is. Yeah. Um, and I don't remember who nope. Fulton plays nope. last, but um, um, Rock Ridge, Rock Ridge has Fulton has uh, Monmouth Roseville this coming week and then Princeton in the last week. So that's okay. that's a so, potential yeah, they do huge play one. Okay. And then Rockridge has Hall and Monmouth Roseville left. So yeah. So kudos to Princeton. Uh, or I, I always shouldn't say kudos because the schedule was put up that way. But two big games for Princeton to close out the year in uh, yeah. Newman and then Fulton. Not an easy task. Which is awesome. Like if we're gonna get right. a condensed schedule, let's get those big time games in there. Let's see some you know some hard hitting, some real yep. big time football out of the Three Rivers. We're certainly getting that with those games. Yep. Well, uh, move, we, move along to the Lincoln Trail. Yeah. 
Uh, so this week, two teams coming off wins. You've got Anna and Weathersfield going to go to Alito to take on Mercer County. Uh, Mid County coming off a loss. They're going to play Cambridge, uh, Ridgewood, I should say, Cambridge, Ridgewood. And then Stark County takes on Princeville. See if Princeton can go to 5-0. and That game is at Princeville. Did I say Princeton? I meant Princeville. That game is at Princeville. Yep. And the other one in that one is the, the you know, the non-conference game, essentially. Marquette is on the road at uh, Monmouth United. So okay. Marquette is going to Monmouth. All right. We'll move along to the Northwest Upstate Illini. Yeah, uh, a game that we just kind of talked about or, or quickly referenced that was a pickup game. Orangeville uh, is going to take on Knoxville. That, that game's in the uh, in the north. Big one, big one in that side is, is Galena against Lee Wynn. Um, you know, Galena still undefeated. Lee Wynn's only losses to Princeton. Lee Wynn's looked good. Yep. Uh, they just had a game cancel against Dakota, so they I think they had the week off. Uh, and then the other game in the north is Stockton playing at East Dubuque. Uh in the South, I believe this was also a, a makeup game or uh, uh, a game that kind of came together last minute. Rockford, Rockford Christian is going to go to West Carroll on Saturday. Amboy plays at Milledgeville. Uh, and a big one, traditional big one, Aquin going to Forreston for a Saturday matchup. Yeah, I really like the Orangeville-Knoxville game. That, that one's a lot of fun. That's another one that, you know, there's two playoff teams from 19 19- two teams that have played well this year. Um, you know, despite the loss that Orangeville had last week, I still think they're a talented football team. And Knoxville's been putting up the numbers. They've been putting up the points. That's a nice that's a nice one yeah. here to get in this spring football one, season. One, one game I did not mention, a crossover game. EPC is going to uh, play at Dupec on Saturday. Yep, yep. So there's, there's another one. Excited to see what Dupec can keep doing. Um, I like, man, that Galena – Lena Winslow game. That's exciting. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. In normal year, I think you wouldn't want to face anybody coming off a of bye week. It seems like, man, you give Lee Win a little rest and then they come in against you. But, you know, Galena's looked pretty good. So that, yeah, this is what, you know, this is what this schedule sets up. It's, it's exciting. That just should be a good one too. Yeah. I'm looking, I'm looking in the South at that Aquin forcing game. Like I said, it's traditionally, the powers of the conference yep. um, or two powers of the conference, I should say. So uh, again, Aquin goes on the road in that one and uh, see if they can keep rolling. Absolutely. Mitch, I think that wraps us up. I think we've, we've discussed, yep. we've hit every storyline, every performance, everything there is to talk about. We'll do it again yeah, next week. An exciting week. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Well, as usual, I'll be, uh, you know, scouring the Twitter universe for, live stream feeds and for yep. uh, ways to watch some of these games. And, you know, I'm sure you'll be doing the same. So we'll be, we'll be keeping in touch, but Mitch, thank you so much for joining me and uh, we'll do it again next week. Sounds good. Can't wait. All right. Well, thank you so much for everybody who listened. We'll be back again. We'll talk about week five. We'll talk results and then we'll talk week six and the final week of the spring football season and what's coming up next. Thank you so much for listening. That'll do it for this week's episode of View from the West. Thank you so much for listening. I encourage you to go out to Apple Podcasts or Podbean and subscribe so you can follow along and downloads will come automatically every week. You can follow along on Twitter at View from West Pod. You can also email me if you're interested in being a sponsor, viewfromwestpod at gmail.com. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week.